Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, so yeah, my name is James Bornholt. Uh, I'm a final year grad student at UW. And I want to tell you about some work we've been doing on how we build the tools that help us to build better software. So we've seen many examples, both here at Uppsala and sort of in the community at large, of automated reasoning tools. These are tools that offer us powerful automation for a variety of really tricky programming tasks. So automated reasoning includes things like verification tools that can check whether or not a program does what we want it to do. So for example, does my program still work if the file system crashes? It also includes synthesis tools. These are tools that can automatically generate a program given a specification of what we want. So for example, maybe to generate code for some weird architecture we don't have a compiler for. And increasingly, automated reasoning is even being used in domains that we don't traditionally think of as programming. So for example, using synthesis to help teach kids the rules of algebra. But I actually don't want to talk today about any of these specific tools. Rather, I want to reflect a little bit on how we build tools like these ones for the domains that you care about, the problems that you have in programming. So in particular, the way that all those tools were built, as well as many other tools like them, is by a technique we call symbolic evaluation. So to build an automated tool using symbolic evaluation, what you do first is you write an interpreter for the language that you care about. So for example, maybe you write an interpreter for file system operations, or an interpreter for new architecture, for the instructions in your new architecture. And then what you do is you provide this interpreter to a symbolic evaluator. These are frameworks like Sketch and like Rosette. And what these frameworks can do for you is they can take as input this interpreter that you wrote and automatically give you back a variety of really powerful automated reasoning tools. So verifiers, synthesizers, debuggers, that kind of thing. And this is really exciting, right? The key power of this approach is that you basically get these tools for free, right? You write a concrete interpreter for the language that you care about, and essentially, the symbolic evaluator lifts that interpreter to do verification and synthesis and that kind of thing. So this sounds great, right? But of course, there's no free lunch in any of these kinds of problems. And in particular, verification and synthesis tools are trying to solve this fundamentally intractable problem. So what can go wrong when you're building a tool like this? Well, I claim that the key challenge to building one of these tools is the question of scale. So even when, uh, sorry, so making these tools work for real world problems is still really difficult. So how do you make these tools scale to real size problems? So the key challenge here is basically that these tools are executing a giant search problem. Right? They're essentially searching all the paths through your interpreter, through your program, to find one that doesn't work in the case of verification, to find a program that works for all the paths in the case of synthesis. They're trying to solve this big, giant search problem. And so the question that our work answers is, how do we guide programmers to build scalable automated reasoning tools that can deal with this all-paths execution model? <coughs> so our solution is a new technique that we call symbolic profiling. So a symbolic profiler pinpoint scalability bottlenecks in an automated reasoning tool. And it does this by constructing two new data structures that summarize symbolic evaluation and then analyzing those data structures to find bottlenecks. Now, of course, once you've found a bottleneck, you need to know how to fix it, right? So one thing that's really cool about symbolic evaluation is that these kinds of repairs can often be made at the program level. So rather than trying to have to hack Rosette or hack Sketch or something like that, you can actually make local changes to the program. And to help you do that, we've identified a catalog of anti-patterns, things that often go wrong in these kinds of tools. Now, we've used symbolic profiling to great success on a variety of real-world automated reasoning tools. We were able to find and fix performance issues in these tools that made them up to 300 times faster. So the plan for today is I want to walk you through each of these three contributions. But first, I want to give you just a little bit more background about symbolic evaluation, how it works. And in particular, I want to focus on this notion of an all-paths execution of a program what can go wrong when you're executing in that fashion. So to do that, I want to show you a really simple example of a program you might write in Rosette. So Rosette is an extension of Racket with support for symbolic evaluation. So it supports verification and synthesis. So here's a really simple program that I've written in Rosette. This is a really silly function. What it does is it takes as input a list, a list of numbers, and it takes as input another number k. And what it's going to give you back is the first k elements of that list that are even. Right? So a very silly function, but it's going to suffice to explain what I need to show you today. So the way it does it is kind of obvious, right? It takes the list, it filters down the list to have only the even elements, and then it takes the first k of those elements and returns them back to you. Now, when the inputs to this function are concrete, you probably know how it works, right? You can probably run this function in your head. But in the context of symbolic evaluation, often we actually don't know the inputs to this function. So for example, imagine you were trying to verify this function, prove some property about this function. You want to prove that property for all possible inputs, not just for one concrete input. So when we don't know the inputs to this function, we actually get into some trouble here. 
because we have to run all the possible paths through this function. So what do I mean by that? So imagine we're trying to execute this filter statement. And imagine that what we're doing is we, have, we don't know the, the, the elements of the list that we passed into the function. But for the purpose of demonstration, let's say we know there are two elements. So we have an input list of two numbers. We don't know the values of those numbers. We also don't know the value of k. So when we go to run this filter statement, the first thing we need to decide is, are we going to keep the first element x0 in our list? Is x0 even? Well, we don't know, right? We, can't, we don't know. So we actually have to fork, right? We have to create two different paths, right? One where we assume x0 is not even, in which case we're not going to keep it. One where we assume x0 is even, so we will keep it in the list. Then we have to do exactly the same thing for x1, right? So at the end of running this filter statement, we have four different paths, four different return values, depending on the assumptions that we make about x0 and x1. <coughs> Only once we've done that can we come to the second line of our function and run this take statement. Except, of course, we can't just run it once, because we have these four different paths now. So we actually have to run it four different times. We also have exactly the same problem we just had, which is we don't know the value of k. So we don't know how many of the values we're going to be returning. So you have to do even more of this forking work, right? So at the end of this execution, what we've observed is that take actually ran two to the two times, right? It ran four times. It did a little bit more forking. And so a naive interpretation of this graph would say, well, take is the problem in this function. Take is the slowest part. It ran the most times. It produced the most outputs. But actually, I would claim the problem in this function is actually filter. And the reason is that filter was the one that created all these paths. So it's actually not take's fault that it had to do all this extra work. Take was had to deal with the stuff that it was given by filter. So if you wanted to fix this function, what you really need to do is to fix the filter that came first. So that sounds really nice. But how can we actually identify this as an issue? How can we find out that actually filter is the problem in this program? So we built a symbolic profile that does exactly that. So the symbolic profile takes this program as input, and it produces output that looks like this. So the top half of this figure here, you might have seen one of these before. It's called a flame chart or a flame graph. If you haven't heard of that, it's basically just a trace over time of what the call stack is doing in your program. It's a pretty common profiling technique. But the real action here is in the bottom, is in this table. So this table is showing us all the functions in our program. Here, there aren't very many. And what it's doing is that the profiler is trying to rank those functions according to how likely it thinks it is that that function is a bottleneck in your program. And so you can see that in this output, we actually put filter first. And the thing that I want to highlight here is that we put filter first, even though it actually was not the slowest part of the program. So as you can see on the right-hand side of those boxes, actually take took longer than filter did. But filter still came first. The profiler still chose filter as the first bottleneck. So it agrees with the analysis it just did manually, that actually filter was the problem in our program. So that's an example of how something like profiling can pinpoint bottlenecks, even when time might mislead us. So now I want to show you a little bit more detail about how symbolic profiling can do this. How will we be able to identify filter as the bottleneck here? So the key thing that I want to show you is the two data structures we developed and how we analyze those data structures. So we have two data structures to do symbolic evaluation. The first one is called the symbolic evaluation graph. And it basically reflects the strategy that the symbolic evaluation engine is taking to evaluate the all paths execution that it needs to do. And the key point there is that there are many different ways to do all paths execution. And I'll show you some of those in just a second. The second data structure is called the symbolic heap. And it basically just summarizes the kinds of symbolic values your program is creating. So the, core, the, the leaf nodes, and maybe we're conjuncting values together, that kind of thing. So it's showing you how much state your program is creating. Now, if there's one key thing that you take away from this talk, I want it to be this slide. And in particular, what I want you to remember is that any symbolic evaluation technique can be summarized using these two data structures. This is not specific to Rosette. It's not specific to any particular technique like symbolic execution. Any symbolic evaluation strategy can be summarized using these two data structures. And therefore, any symbolic evaluation strategy can be profiled in this way. OK, so let me tell you a little bit more about how these two data structures work. Let's start with the symbolic evaluation graph. So the symbolic evaluation graph essentially just summarizes the branching and merging decisions that your evaluation engine is making. So the nodes of the symbolic evaluation graph are program states. So here I've abstracted program states just a little bit to show you the intermediate values and the return values of each of the function calls we're making. And then the edges between these nodes are the transitions between those different program states. Now it turns out actually you've already seen an example of a symbolic evaluation graph. It was exactly the graph we were drawing a few slides ago. Right? This is a symbolic evaluation graph. The nodes are program states. The edges are transitions. And the key point was that when we started at the top with the filter, we forked into two different program states, depending on the assumptions we were making about values. So this is a symbolic evaluation graph. Now, just for the purpose of making the slides a little bit cleaner, I'm going to get rid of the bottom of this graph and just talk exclusively about filter, just to keep things a little bit cleaner. So it turns out that actually this is not the only way to do all paths execution. 
right? This was a nice, convenient way, but it's actually just one technique. You've probably heard of it before. It's symbolic execution. And the key point is that every time we have to make a decision, we fork in two. This is not the only way to do it, though. In fact, there's a whole spectrum of ways to do symbolic evaluation, to do this all paths execution model. Sort of the other extreme, the opposite to symbolic execution, is what's often known as bounded model checking. So bounded model checking starts out the same way. We fork into two. But then immediately, after we've done that fork, we merge these two paths back together into just one program state. And that program state is going to summarize the two different paths that we might have come from. So you end up with just one program state after we've considered the first element of the list. And then we can do the rest of the program. So we can fork again to consider whether we're going to include the second element, and then merge those two paths back together again as well. So what's nice about this is that we end up at the end with just one program state. We don't have those exponentially many paths that we had as public execution. So this seems good, right? And this is a better symbolic evaluation graph than the phone on the left. But there's a downside, right? The downside is that these states are more complicated. You can kind of see that intuitively. You can see that we had to create these temporary variables. These temporary variables talk about things like lists. Whereas on the left, you can look at the four program states at the bottom and actually conclude a lot about them. You can tell me that they're all lists. You can tell me how long each of them is. You can tell me what their elements are. So there's a trade-off here between how wide the graph gets, how many times we branch, versus how many times we merge back together and how complicated the states get when we do that. And the symbolic evaluation graph only tells you about the branching and merging part. It doesn't tell you about the complications in the states. So for that, we need a second data structure. And we call that the symbolic heap. So the symbolic heap really just summarizes how values are being used in your program, how symbolic values are being used in your program. So the nodes in the symbolic heap are the symbolic terms you're creating. So symbolic variables, conjunctions of those variables, that sort of thing. And then the edges between them are just subterm relationships. So this is the symbolic heap for the symbolic execution example. I'm not going to walk through how it's constructed. What I want you to see is the difference between that and the symbolic heap that we get for bounded model checking. And in particular, what I want you to notice here is that the heap for bounded model checking has all these list operations in it and other kinds of weird operations in it, right? We have to talk about append, we have to talk about cons and list elements and that kind of thing. Whereas on the left, we just have booleans, basically. So this is a much simpler state. So this really gets at the core of the distinction between symbolic execution and about a model checking. Symbolic execution has really simple heaps, but complicated evaluation graphs, and bounded model checking is the opposite. Now, in practice, most symbolic evaluation engines end up somewhere in the middle, and choosing where you end on that spectrum between ex symbolic execution and bounded model checking is really the key to building a tool that scales well. So having these two data structures lets us tell you how to build a tool that scales well. But of course, you don't want to look at these graphs all day, right? And actually, in fact, earlier in the talk, I showed you the actual output from the profiler. So the final step is going from these two data structures to actually output that looks like this. So how do we summarize those two data structures in output that you can actually read and make decisions on? So we do that in two stages. First of all, for each of the procedures in your program, we just analyze the metrics that come out of that graph. So you analyze, for example, how many new terms did this function create? Or how many branches did this function create? And we summarize that for every function in your program. And then secondly, the symbolic profiler then aggregates those metrics into a score. And there's details in the paper about how that score is calculated. But basically, it's trying to rank the functions according to how much symbolic work they're actually doing. And that's what allows us to put filter first in this example we were seeing earlier. Even though it was faster than take, it was doing more of the symbolic work. And therefore, we think it was actually the true cause of the problem. So that's how we create and then analyze a symbolic profile. I wanted to now tell you how you go about fixing problems like this. So once you've found a, pro a problem using the profiler, how do you go about fixing the problem, making it better? So to help you do that, we've collected a, a collection of what we call anti-patterns. These are things that often go wrong in symbolic evaluation tools. And I want to show you them to you just really briefly. There's more details in the paper about these. So we found three common anti-patterns in these tools. The first one is what we call an algorithmic mismatch. And basically the idea here is that the kinds of algorithms and optimizations that often make a lot of sense to you in concrete code might actually make things worse in the symbolic context when you're trying to do this all path execution. So let me show you an example of that really briefly. Here's a really classic uh, functional algorithm, right? This, takes, this is a linked list update. So it takes as input a linked list, an index in that linked list, and the value we want to store at that index. And it's going to create for us a new linked list that has that value at that index. And it does that recursively, right? It just recurses down the list until it finds the element it wants to fix, right? So if index is equal to zero, then we know we've found the element we're trying to update. So we update that value, and then we stop recursing. Because we know we found the value. We don't have to keep recursing anymore. This seems totally fine, right? So we terminate early as soon as we found the index in that list. This is a totally reasonable optimization to make in concrete settings. But now imagine actually that you don't know the value of index. Maybe you're trying to prove something about list set, or you're using it where you don't know the index you're going to update. Now you have a problem. Because we're always going to keep recursing, because we don't know whether index is equal to zero or not. I went forward one slide too many. So 
we don't know whether index is equal to zero or not. And so what that means is that every time we get to that point, we have to branch. Right? We have to say, if index is equal to zero, then we'll stop recursing. Otherwise, we'll keep recursing. So we actually have to keep doing that recursion. We have to keep track of all the decisions we made to get to that point. So we have to remember that index wasn't equal to zero, so we made a recursive call. Then index minus one wasn't equal to zero, so we made another recursive call. We have to remember all these decisions we were making. And so this is actually really inefficient. So a more efficient version is the one that I accidentally skipped to before, which is to just not do that conditional recursion. Right? To just recurse down the list unconditionally. So here it's almost the same thing, except the if statement now talks only about the value we're going to put at that index in the list, and then we unconditionally recurse down the rest of the list. And this is obviously inefficient if you know the value of the index. But if you don't know the value of the index, this is actually much better, because the recursion structure is now totally uniform. We'll always recurse the same number of times. We don't have to keep track of what decisions we made when we were making those recursive calls. So this is much more efficient. And so we always recurse to the end of the list. And just to show you this is actually more efficient, here's some really rough data. So on the x-axis here is the length of the list we're setting the value in. Y-axis is how long that takes. So the blue dots here are the original version, and the green dots here are this version. Right? So this is much better when you don't know the index, asymptotically better, in fact. So that's one example of an, of a, of an anti-pattern we call an algorithmic mismatch. I want to summarize for you really briefly the other two. I don't have time to show you examples of both of them. But the other two uh, common anti-patterns we've seen are uh, what we call an irregular representation. This is kind of like an algorithmic, algorithmic mismatch, but for data structures. So it's a common optimization to optimize your data structures for space, but that makes them irregular. And so actually, in symbolic code, it can be much better to waste some space to have all your data structures be the same size. Pretty common optimization. The final anti-pattern we've seen a lot is what we call a missed concretization. And this is basically the idea that you might, in your head, know the value of a certain variable. So you might know, for example, that the variable x can only ever be 0 or 1. But your evaluation engine doesn't know that. It just knows it's some unknown value x. And so if you know that the values are a limited set, you can actually concretize those values, actually make them explicit in the program, and that makes it much, much faster. That's another common optimization we have to make in these kinds of tools. So these are common anti-patterns. In the paper, we have examples of each of these. We have examples of how to repair each of these. And we also found many examples of these anti-patterns in the case studies that I'll show you in just a second. So let's get to those case studies. I want to show you a couple of results that show that symbolic profiling is really effective in practice. So first of all, we didn't implement symbolic profiling just once. Actually, there are three different implementations of symbolic profiling. So the first one we developed was in Rosette, which I showed you earlier. It's the one we've been seeing the entire time through the talk. This is an implementation for, uh, for Rosette based in Racket. We also developed a second implementation for Jelangi, which is a dynamic analysis framework for JavaScript. And actually, really cool, since publication, um, our colleagues at Gawa have taken the same idea and implemented it in their Crucible tool. And what's cool about that is that they were able to reuse most of our code. The only thing they had to be able to do was generate their own symbolic evaluation graph from their tool, their own symbolic heap, pass it to our code, and we can do the same analysis. And they've been getting really good results. So we have three different implementations. For the purpose of time, I'm just going to focus on the Rosetta implementation today and show you some results for that. There are Jelangi results in the paper as well. So I want to show you two points about this Rosetta implementation. The first thing I want to show you is that we can find real bugs. So to do that, we performed a series of case studies. So we gathered up a, ver a huge number of published tools based on Rosette, and we ran the profile on all of them. I ran the profile on all of them and looked for bugs. And I was able to find a total of eight bugs. I'm showing six of them here. Um, bugs in, in, in these published tools. And we can get speed ups anywhere from about 35% to all the way down to 290 uh, times faster on these tools. And many of our patches to these tools were accepted by the developers. Um, I want to highlight this one down the bottom here, the 290 times faster. First of all, that's a really big number. But secondly, um, this is actually a really interesting tool. This actually is being used in production at the University of Washington Medical Center. They're in the middle of uh, rebuilding the software for a radiotherapy system, and they use this tool to verify that software. So making that 300 times faster actually makes the development cycle much, much better. So that's a really exciting result for us. But so I was able to find real-world bugs in other people's tools by downloading them and running the profiler. But really, the question for you should be, can you find bugs using a profiler like this one? So to, to see whether or not that was possible, we also ran a small user study. So we collected a, a group of Rosette programmers, and I gave them some projects, some code that I had written that, I had, that had known performance issues. And I asked the users to find the performance issues in those tools. And so it's a small user study, so I'm not going to make any statistical claims here. But users were able to solve every task more quickly when they had access to our tool than when they didn't have access to our tool. And in particular, when we, gave them the, uh, when we didn't give them access to symbolic profiling, there were six cases where they just couldn't find the performance issue. Whereas when we gave them access to our tool, they'd never had that problem. So people were much more effective at finding performance issues using symbolic profiling. 
of course, more exciting to me is sort of the qualitative feedback of what people thought about using a tool like this one. people thought they, for the first time, actually understood what rosetta was doing and how spoiler execution worked by using looking at the profiler output and you know these benchmarks are written by me rather than by them. so a lot of people said they think it would be even more useful if they're actually running it on their own code rather than my code. so actually people other than me can use symbolic profiling to find bugs in rosetta-based tools. Uh, we have more results in the paper that I don't have time to show you, things like uh, how the overhead of uh, something like profiling, things like how sensitive that ranking function I was mentioning earlier is. Um, but those are the results I wanted to show you today. And so that's it. So symbolic profiling is a way of uh, identifying bottlenecks in automated reasoning tools like verifiers and synthesizers. Uh, if you're a Rosette user already, symbolic profiling is already integrated in Rosette. It's just a command line away. Uh, it's also, like I said, integrated into Crucible if you're a Galois uh, client. Um, and if not, uh, check out our website at unsat.org. We have more results there and the paper and the artifact and that kind of thing. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Hey, uh, really good work. Really enjoyed the talk. Um, so when you find one of these bugs, you have to manually change the program yourself. That's right. Um, you might break the semantics yep. not knowing it. Do, do you have any automated way to at least give a hint that the program is still doing the same that it did before? Yeah, Thanks. so we don't have that right now. We would, it would be really nice to have that kind of thing. We're working on it. Um, it's a little bit tricky. We've, we've tried some experiments where we generalize from the results that we showed you to suggest a fix, and a fix that we know is sound. But it's a, little bit, it's a complicated problem, like you can probably imagine. But we're working on it. Yeah. Uh, uh, quick question. Um, so this works fine, I guess, for symbolic execution and yes. some bottom model checking. But if yep. you think about abstract interpreters, for example, right. so I take the CFG, yep. the graph is given. Um, and you can you know, do some statistics about the, the, the size of, the, of each node of, of your domain. Right. But you are misregarding like the, the evaluation strategy, right? The way the mm -hmm. fixed point really work. Right. So is this a limitation of your technique or? Yeah, we haven't considered the, the abstract interpretation side where you actually care about that as opposed to just the, whether the expensive part is really just cranking through these states in the first place. Just generating those states is expensive. Um, it would be interesting to figure that out. I, I don't know the answer to that. Thanks. Okay, we are running out of time, so let's take remaining questions.